What's up, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Uh, this is Drew Stone, and uh, we appreciate you listening in. Uh, hope you're doing well and uh, surviving the current zombie apocalypse. We're going to talk about a lot of great stuff today. We're going to have some fun. This is the the maiden voyage here. Um, so let's 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 jump right into it. Uh, we got an hour here. And uh, let's bring on Rap Bones, huh? Yo, what's up, everybody? What's happening, Rap Bones? Chilling, chilling in New York. What? Uh, what's what's the uh, what's the update? What's the man in the street update in New York City? It's quiet. The freaks come out at night. It's shady. People are yelling at you in the store. You know, stupid shit. Regular New York shit. But there's that overlooming elephant in the room, right? You've been going out. For some fresh air, once a day we ride the bikes down to the water. That's about it. Good, good. I'm in Florida right now, so you know I haven't. I have. I actually came down to Florida the day after the last A7 show, and uh, I've been down here ever since with my dad. So I've been down here. We're in a calm, safe place, and I don't think I'm going back to New York for a while. So yeah, yep. yeah. It's, yeah, pretty, it's pretty nuts when you're in a city and, uh, you know, you don't really know what can happen. New York's a scary place right now. It sure is. Yeah, man. Let's, uh, it's all right. Yeah, man. How's your kid? How's Stella? Luke and Stella are great. We're hanging in. We're watching a lot of movies. Everything's online. What are you going to do, man? Pay your bills. <laughs> keep happy, right? <laughs> well, let's keep, well, let's keep it moving and let's bring on... Sid the Kid. What's happening? Hey, Sid the Kid. Rap Bones. Drew Stone. What's going on, guys? Where are you, Sid? What, where are you? Uh, right now, just like Rap Bones, um, in New York City. Been here since uh, it all pretty much went down, and I don't plan on leaving. I know some people want to leave. Some don't have that opportunity or don't have the chance, but just dug in and, you know, got to deal with it pretty much. Are you, uh, are you in Brooklyn? Where are you? No, I'm in Upper Manhattan at the moment. Um been here for the last uh, five years in this area. Pretty content with it. I mean, even though it's not as bad as what some people are claiming, like it just depends on where you live. I mean, the, my neighborhood's pretty chill. I mean, everybody will go out for the essentials. Then you got that other group that wants to do whatever. But, you know, I'm just dealing with my own thing like everybody else is and, you know, just trying to make the best of it at the moment right now. Do you miss DJ? Do you miss DJing? We all miss everything, Drew. You miss. I, I, I hear sirens. Wow, that's 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 like, me. That's me. That, that's right. That's in New York. An ambulance. Wow. Yeah, I'm actually you know because even funny enough, I'm looking at the uh, through the app or through the YouTube app, just checking, uh, seeing who's saying what as well because I can't see it on the private chat or actually the live comments. I should be looking. What do you fucking guys uh, don't have a computer? I'm, well, I'm on the computer. Well, I got a computer in the bedroom. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm hanging in there just like everybody else is. And the best thing we could all do is just try to occupy Ooh. ourselves in a positive light, like trying to do something. Even though you're home, there's got to be something you could do to uh, be productive. There you go. We're, we're, words of wisdom from Sid, from DJ Sid the Kid. Uh, Vinny, right. Vinny's got way better stuff than I do, though. All right. Hey, listen, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep it moving. Uh, we'll talk to you guys a little bit later. All right, we're gonna bring. Yeah, let, let's, let's bring. Hold on. Let's. What's happening, Stephen? Hey, how are you? What's going on? Uh, not too much. Not too much. I'm in uh, Flushing, Queens, actually, right on the border of Flushing and Corona, right here, <laughs> and uh, where we just call it the virus. And right. uh, doing okay. Happy to be still still be working. You know. Is um, where are you right now? What's that behind you? Oh, the I'm in a, That's what he has. I'm, I'm in the supply room right now. I'm 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 sitting on a mountain of uh, nitrile gloves right here, and uh, breathing masks and sanitizer and all the things to keep all of our people safe. You know, keep it moving, Stephen. For those that don't, for those that don't know, Stephen Messino, aka Hardcore Shutterbug, uh, works for the Long Island Railroad. And what what what? You're in the yard in Queens now, right? Yeah, in, in Flushing Queens, a uh, uh, Shea yard. 
Okay. So, yeah, one of the things we're going to do, we're, we're going to do on the show uh, is we're going to have Stephen come on each day and we're going to, um, we asked him to give us a photo a day and uh, we're going to ask him about it and see what's up. So let me, let me dig up, let me dig up the first photo here. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Wow, that is. Um, Sick. So this is this is our inaugural. We're gonna do photo of the day as Stephen's gonna go deep into his archives, and from what I can gather, it looks like Vinny Stigma, right? Why don't you tell us the background on this thing? Yeah, that is uh, that is the Godfather right there. He, uh, we took this. Uh, this was around the time of the filming of New York Blood and the recording of the New York, uh, of the New York Blood solo album. And Vinny and I spent a day walking around Mott Street, where he's basically the mayor. And uh, he took me to all his favorite spots. And he took me to this church, which uh, he showed me a plaque on the wall that his father actually helped build the church. And it was pretty cool. In fact, since then... That church was gutted and rebuilt, and it doesn't look really anything like that anymore. But it was really, really cool. And he felt bad afterwards because he said, oh, I should have taken my hat off. It's kind of disrespectful that I left my hat on. And I said, oh, they'll, you know, they'll be fine. And uh, But I love that shot. I actually have this framed at my house, this shot. I think this is one of my favorites. And uh, and this, this, this church, his, if I remember correctly, uh, knowing my Vinny Stigma history, uh, didn't his like great grandfather uh, help uh, put the stained glass in, or, or help build this church? Or well, something? I, his father, I believe. I oh, think his it was father. his father, or right. um, and uh, I actually have a picture of the plaque. I'm not sure. I thought, in fact, I think there were more than one uh, of his family members involved, and uh, which I think is great. I think it's cool. But then when I went to show somebody not long afterwards, it was like I said, they had totally gutted it and rebuilt it. It's right. It's right on Mott Street. It's not. It's like a block. Yeah. From well, where he lives. And, yeah. and and you know, for for those that may not know, you know, Vinny Stigma still lives in the same apartment that he uh, grew up in on Mott Street uh, in uh, Manhattan in Little, uh, what's known as Little Il Little Italy. And uh, at one point, his whole family lived in this very same building, and he's still in the apartment that that he grew up in. It's uh, it's pretty incredible. If you um, if you ever watched my 10 questions series, uh, the 10 questions with Vinny Stigma is done in his, his kitchen. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's pretty they should cool. make that a landmark actually. Hard yeah, right. landmark. <laughs> yeah. We, they, they didn't landmark CBGBs, but they should, they should, uh, they should the, landmark the Stigma uh, house. <laughs> St Stigma's house. Right on. Right on. All right. Well, you take care of yourself, man. You too. Everybody be safe. Stay home. All right. Good. Good. So, all right, um, keeping it moving. I see some comments there. Uh, I see a bunch of people are tuning in. I appreciate, uh, you know, people around the world. Uh, we're just get, we're just get. I'm just getting this thing started. Uh, uh, on Friday, we're gonna have Billy from Biohazard on. Uh, on every Sunday, we're gonna do an A7 themed show, where um, we have like A7 bands. It's like a matinee thing. Next week, I'm gonna have Michael Alago on. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, the shows, I think the shows are going to be Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, uh, 3 o'clock. So that's, that, that's what we're doing. So, so next up, let's just keep it moving. Uh, let's bring, let's bring a, an, an, old friend of our, an old friend of ours on, uh, Mr. Dan Nastasi. How you doing, buddy? Trying to survive, man. Yeah, where are you? What's going on? I'm in uh, Dirty Jersey. Upper Upper New Jersey here, Bergen County, and uh, like Steve said, man, it's it's like it's like zombie apocalypse. It's just yeah, crazy, yeah, it really sure. is. But like everything, I really uh, I think positives will come out of this somehow, some way in the uh, in the future. I I definitely think that there's always a positive in every negative, you know. So I'm um, whether it's you know, people washing their hands, people, you know, paying more attention or, or really 
hygienically, whatever it might be. I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping that there's a silver lining of all this or a positive that comes out of it. Hey, is that a, is that the ice cold killers t-shirt you're wearing? It is. <laughs> we love those guys. This is the coolest t-shirt I have. Yeah. Yeah. We love those guys. The ice cold killers. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're great. A little, little motor head, yep. you know, a little, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're great. So so let's let let's talk a little bit about you, your your career a little bit, and uh, so I, I guess in in a certain way, uh, from what I from what I know, what I what I understand, um, you guys you started playing music in about 1986, and you guys were in, in a cover band called Predator. Is that right? Where'd you find that out? Ah, yeah, that's, that's actually how I met the Milnes brothers. <laughs> Was yeah. Who still knows these <laughs> things? Uh, so so what, wait wait so so that's oh go on Let, let's hear it. predator. Let, what's the background on that? Uh, that was really that really never even I don't even think we ever even played a show to be honest. But uh, a friend of mine Scott Tatino that I went to high school with yeah was already jamming with the Milnes brothers with John and Chris Milnes and we went to high school together and I had a guitar that I was you know, playing around on. And Scott, I believe, uh, asked me if I wanted to go jam with Chris and John Milnes one day. And, and, uh, and we did that. And originally it was like just playing cover songs, you know, if I remember correctly. Right. So yes, the name of the cover band, I believe was, was definitely Predator. And so, so, so I got a photo for you. Maybe you could, you can, oh, uh, you could decipher you you for this for me. Let me see. Oh, you you're such an asshole, man. <laughs> that so, that so, is so the what? inside sleeve of the now the Mucky Pup Now album. <laughs> is that right? Oh, this actually made this this actually made the airwaves, huh? Yeah, oh my God, man. All right. Hey, man, it's a sign of the times. It was a long time ago. Absolutely. Who you talking about? 1990, 89, and, 90. And this is uh, Chris's brother is in, is on the on the left. Yeah, John. Yeah, Booge is all the way to my right. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah, Chris in the middle, and Mark the Baker. Played right. bass on the album. He replaced Dave Niebuhr and Mark DeBaker actually was the guy that took my uh he replaced me permanently. Paris actually originally replaced me uh in Dog Eat Dog to tour and do the biohazard tour. Uh that was the tour they did during my wedding. My actual wedding was on April 30th, and I just and we got the biohazard tour after all Borough Kings came out. And I, you know, obviously I couldn't cancel my wedding. So Paris filled in. Paris uh, from Paris made, tour, Paris made Mark from Baker. the Pro Yeah. And then Mark DeBaker was the uh was the permanent replacement, I guess, that they uh, I was um I was on that tour in Europe with Biohazard. Really? And that's that's when I was working with Biohazard right after we did the uh, punishment video. Yeah. And um uh, might even have been after the Shades of Grey video or just when- just Right when, after the Slam video, the Onyx oh, okay. Slam video. Uh, yeah, because okay. we played the Academy Theater with them. That's right. The day That's they right. recorded it, which was still the my most favorite show I've ever played in my life. Well, that's, that's we're getting there. We're getting the dog eat dog. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. What a great yeah. show. Well, that was the Academy and that's that's where we shot the, uh, the that's where we shot, we shot some footage for Shades of Grey there. We shot the Bionic Slam, slam video there. But yeah. you, you, you know, I, you know, I, I got a, I got a vivid memory of what, when, when we, when I, when we were doing the punishment video for Biohazard, we were going out and seeing Biohazard play and kind of connecting with them. Yeah. And, and one of the places that they would play is out in Jersey, and you guys, you guys used to play with them all the time. It was at Studio One. Is that what I'm? Yeah, thinking? Studio One. Yeah. And it was like upstairs. It was like a ballroom. Such a like great memories from that place yo man. i have vivid memories of you guys killing it in that place like yeah, that was your spot. Love. we actually we ripped the sink out of the wall in the dressing room and threw it out the window <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i i, I mean you know the, the, but, those... it, but it was a great period of time also you know that yeah. was like 90 
one, ninety two, ninety three, and uh, Studio One in Jersey was was just a great great club. I mean, don't leave your car running out in front. They they I saw two cars get stolen. They'd steal your car if you left the car running. The car was gone. Well, there was all those there was all those kind of places in Jersey back then, like Studio One. Yeah. I remember the Pipeline in Newark. Pipeline is right across the street. So yeah. we'd play Studio One Friday night, and the next Sunday we played a pipe the Pipeline. Right. You know. So it was just uh, it was a it was a great period of time, man. And honestly, so much great music at, right in that time period. I know it's been said so many times, but yeah, absolutely from eighty eight to ninety four might be the you know the best at least stuff that I like to listen to. I mean, the best five six year period. Yeah, yeah, for sure, and. Killer. You know, I know that the first, the, the first doggy dog, um, what the first, oh, you know, I got something else. Hold on. This is a good one. Hold on. Bond Street Cafe. Somebody just wrote. Oh. <laughs> Hold your horses. I got something cool. So what's up with this? No more embarrassing pictures. Oh, that's the original EP. Oh, that's yeah. the original demo. That's the demo, right? That is the original. Let me, yeah. That's the, what is that? Funnel King. Of course, I don't even remember that. <laughs> but uh, that is the original, original first demo. Yeah. That we put together and recorded, I believe. And I think I think Booge played drums on that as well. Yeah, yeah that's what it says. Dave, Sean, you, yep. Johnny, and, and Booge play, play drums. So that's the original Dog Eat Dog demo. And then what was this thing about this Bloom County comic you guys won uh, some some contest and got to get on this this soundtrack thing and that what yeah was that, that was Billy and the Boingers <clears throat> that was Mucky Pup that wasn't Dog Eat Dog ah okay Mucky Pup sense. was uh, the song You Stink But I Love You right the original demo version of You Stink But I Love You was uh, there was like a contest uh, Chris Milnes he did it all really I mean he right. in terms of Mucky Pup Chris Milnes is like you know it's essentially was Chris Milne's band. I mean, at the time right. we were so much younger than Chris and Chris really handled everything with Mucky Pup. He was, I mean, Mucky entered Mucky us Pup. in this contest, uh, Bloom County, Billy and the Boingers, right. but it was a big comic at the time. And the contest, if you won the contest, they put a 45 in the next book, I believe that got released, which sold millions of copies, you know? So that was that was the beginning of that. The um, I mean, I mean, people sort of this has got a kind of this kind of got lost in the swirling sands of time. But you guys got over to Europe real early on. And actually, yeah. the first I think the first time the first tour that Biohazard even did in Europe was opening up for Mucky Pup. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mucky Pup. We, we went we went to Europe in 19. 90? 90? Yeah. 1988. Yeah. We went to Europe, uh, a company, Metal Ease at the time. That was right after Can't You Take a Joke came out and right before we were going to record A Boy in a Man's World. Right. And, yeah, I mean, that was right when the Berlin Wall was coming down. Like, we went to the Berlin Wall as people were, like, taking it down. It was uh, incredible. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Hey, I want I want to take a moment. I just see uh, in some of the comments. I want to shout out some of our friends. I see John Milnes on there. So what's oh, yeah. up, Laura, Laura Zeitlin, and uh, of course the nuns. I see the nuns and Steen in Denmark. People from all over the world, and uh, that's sure. great. Appreciate awesome. it. You know, thanks thanks for for tuning in. Uh, you know, inaugural show, and we're gonna keep it going. Um, so so dog eat dog. So what made you sort of want to get cracking on dog eat dog and, and you wrote a lot of the early dog eat dog stuff right yeah i mean i love to write i mean even during like this you know pandemic uh whatever i mean there's really not much going on work wise and everything and honestly i've i've been you know working on writing you know in the downtime me and larry it have been like sending stuff back and forth and you know, I've written two or three songs in the last two or three weeks, you know, that, that I think are pretty good. And although the whole situation sucks, I love to write. I mean, I, I, you know, to me, my favorite 
thing in music is the is creating the sound, the band, the, you know, writing of the songs. Like I love that. That's you know, that's well, there you ab go. absolutely you know the the highlight of it for me. But nice. of course, like you know, the old you know the Mucky Pup. You know, Doggy Dog was so different than Mucky Pup. Um, you know, I guess the quick story of it is that you know I was in Mucky Pup, obviously through you know recorded a Boy in a Man's World. And then after A Boy in a Man's World, you know, I was going through a lot of things at the time, but I decided to leave Mucky Pup. And right after that, I uh, got offered an opportunity to audition for Murphy's Law. Todd Youth had just left Murphy's Law. So I got an opportunity to audition for Murphy's Law and did that. And, uh, you know, great, you know, I'm grateful, but I, I got that gig and uh, wound up uh, touring with Murphy's Law for about uh, about a year. Um, and we were actually in Europe for like at least two months. And I just felt that Murphy's Law wasn't mine. You know, Mucky Pup was something like I felt like the band was was a part of me. You know, I wrote. A lot of those songs, you know, uh, and I just felt like it was mine. And I also knew that I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to, you know, Mucky Pup was like almost like a comedy hardcore band. Like it was meant to be funny and or uh, and or, you know, have some satire to it. And that's what, you know, a 16, 17 year old kid, I guess at the time that that's what I wrote about. But uh, after being in Murphy's Law, I wound up uh, going back to Mucky Pup, and that's when we right away recorded the Now album. And after we did the Now album, that's when you spoke about earlier. We uh, uh, it was actually Chris Milnes again. He wanted to take Biohazard to Europe with us to open. And at that time, you know, Mucky Pup going to Europe. I mean, it was easily. 500 to 1200 people a night you those know, were, those out were in Europe and it was a great opportunity for biohazard you know those were, those were special times in Europe because yeah uh, the uh, the Europe crowd was so hungry and so into anything really coming out of New York and yep the United remember, States in general though a lot of California bands were doing well right. you know it wasn't just I don't think it was initially just New York bands. It was right. bands from the United States, and uh, especially back like in 88. The Can't You Take a Joke tour we did in Europe, we had no idea what to expect. And like the first night, I think it was in Belgium, and there was like 250 kids in a club. Like we couldn't believe it. And they knew the words to, you know, it was, it's really a special time, really yeah. was. And I look back on it and like, I'm just so grateful that, that I was able to be a part of something like that. You know? Yeah, man, it, it was a special time. Let's uh, let's jump into the present and let's bring one of your bandmates on. Yeah, so, of course. So, you know, the past is great, but you know, let, let's let's get it, let's get into the present. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, uh, you know, uh, La Lawrence Naroda, aka Larry the Hunter. What's happening, <laughs> buddy? What's up, everybody? How are you? All right, man. Trying to do what I got to do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me ask you, where does where does uh, where does the moniker Larry the Hunter come from? Uh, that's a Lou DiBella, who you uh, know well. Yeah. Uh, that was a, that was actually when we were doing, uh, he got me involved in Son of Scam. And when they, they had like, uh, there was a real half-assed demo, like a homemade demo before I got involved with those guys had. And they had like kind of funny nicknames in it. And uh, I didn't know anybody else in the band, just Lou at the time and lou uh he he was like this he he just came up with that because i i hunt deer and from pennsylvania and this and that but that's that's all him the great nicknamer he is uh he he is he is good like that yeah. um you know just just i mean you, you got you got a little bit of a pedigree yourself through the years sub-zero murphy's law son of scam loved and hated sheer terror inhuman and you play with stigma in his solo band and, uh, and it, more recently, you've kind of arrived with Dan in uh, in Kings Never Die. Tell me how. Tell us how how that kind of came around. Uh, the Kings Never Die thing. Yeah. 
I I knew Dan through Sean Kilkenny, who I played with in in Murphy's Law for a little bit years before. And, wow! Uh, wow! Another guy that was in Murphy's Law, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, for a little while, when I joined Murphy's Law, in right after, not long after 9/11, Shawnee was playing, and we did a two guitar thing for a little bit. But somewhere right. around there, uh, he introduced me to Dan at a show or something. I knew who Dan was before that. I knew who Sean was before that because I used to go to see Monkey Pub, and I saw Doggy Dog at, the, at Bond Street, and at Wetlands, and all that. So I knew who they were, you know. But um, Dan had come. Dan comes to stigma shows, and and I knew him for years, you know. Uh, but we were. I called Dan out of the blue because I was looking for something else, and uh, and I wanted to chat with him a little bit, and he and it was just like that, he was like, I have some stuff. Uh, uh, he was doing things with leeway, which he still does here and there, and he had things that were not necessarily leeway sounding and said uh you know what are you doing i said nothing really i'm looking for something and he came over and we started jamming we were he, he had tunes and so we started putting stuff down and rearranging and writing stuff like right away it's a year now actually since we just started out who's that good looking guy in the upper left yeah <laughs> <laughs> What happened to Drew? We lose Drew. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, sorry, yeah, I just sorry, I, sorry oh, about that. That's all good. Um, Dan, anything? How to come together on your end? It was really, I mean, just like Larry said, you know, we've known each other and uh, just had a phone conversation, and uh, you know, I had just, just like he said, I, I just, you know, wrote a couple songs with Eddie. Uh, the you know those two new leeway songs I'm your pusher and as I you know was really getting back into writing and really enjoying and I'm realizing like what on the things I'm writing I mean they're they're not leeway style uh it's not leeway style music you know the choruses were either like big shout or sing along type choruses the music was more of just like a you know, old school, hardcore style. Um, and with the leeway stuff, I wanted to make sure that anything I did with Eddie, that it at least did the leeway name some justice. You know what I mean? Like, I'm your pusher to me sounds like a leeway song. And, and, and like, you know, no bones about it. Like, I am the biggest leeway fan, you know, on the planet. Like, Born to Expire inspired so many bands and you know myself and early doggy dog for sure uh totally inspired by leeway and that you know hardcore style mixing with metal and you know obviously you know i would say a tiny bit of maybe hip-hop involved in that as well you know again that's another sign of the times but uh but i thought that i'm um, your pusher did the leeway name some justice where the other stuff I was, I w I was working on was, uh, was not leeway style or was not in the leeway vein. And as I just kept writing and writing and then Larry, you know, when I spoke to Larry, I mentioned it and, uh, within, you know, he's like, Hey, I've been working on a few things as well. And I said, well, let's get together. So I went by his place in Jersey city and, uh, we j I mean, I think before we left, we were kind of like, hey, you know, like, you know, it. Kings Never Die was kind of like when I left his place in Jersey City that night, the band was kind of like formed, you know, that night. So it just clicked. And, you know, every great band is about like, do you enjoy working and writing with the people you're with? Because, you know, I write or have a lot of ideas for songs, but without Dave, John Connor and Sean, the dog eat dog songs would never be what they turned out to be. Like we, you know, somebody might have the idea or the chorus or, you know, I have these riffs and, but it's about the band putting it together. And it's the same thing here. Like I write a song, nothing would be as good without Larry. And then he listens to it. He changes things, you know, it's camaraderie and working together. And uh, it just clicks, you know, it just clicks. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I know 
you know, we consider you guys, uh, you know, we've been doing these A7 shows for a while now, the, the Back to the New York Hardcore Roots series. And the, the series has been really um, successful, in lack of a better term. Uh, a whole new generation of kids has come out. And, you know, I think at this point, a year into it, uh, there's certain bands that are sort of fan favorites and that uh, have come back a couple of times. And uh, Kings Never Die is one of those bands. You guys are, we can see, you know, you guys are an A7 band. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, think, you guys, I think that as well, man. We love, I mean, I love it. Larry, I, you know, I'm sure you feel the same well, way. Well, I mean, I played there with Stigma. That was crazy good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kings Never Die debut show was killer. And Leeway. But what Dan just played there, and that was killer. I mean, we're there. <laughs> yeah, that 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 stigma show was an early early A seven show. I think that was the yeah. second show we did, and uh, that was that was a great night. That that, that was awesome. Great, great that, fun. Great night. But yeah, you guys, you know, definitely definitely uh, consider uh, you guys uh, an A seven band. Um, I just want to say I see a lot of people uh, uh, in the chat room. If anybody has a question, um, post it up. Uh, you know, I have I have the I have the ability to uh, to put your question on the screen for these guys or or, or whatever. Uh, we see we see lots of friends out there. Um, so if anybody has anything, if anybody has anything, a, a cool question or, or anything. Hi, Kay, how you doing? Um, you know, okay. let, let's keep it moving. Um, you know, I want to bring I want to bring someone else on you guys, and 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 then we'll pull you back in. I want to bring. Next up, I want to bring Ed McCurdy, oh, Ed on from, uh, from Locked Inside. What, what's happening, Ed? Hey, now. Hold on. Let me – I was uh, just getting some technical things set up there. Sorry about that. How's Jersey? <laughs> you know, it was good the last time I was there. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? I, I, always, I always seem to think that Ed, uh, Ed's out in Jersey. For some well, time. I am from Jersey originally. Right. You know? Right. The Jersey straight edge uh, runs through my blood, buddy. Right, right. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about about what you've been up to. I mean, uh, you know, you you sing now for Locked Inside, of course, right? And but you were a bass player before in in, in a bunch of bands, right? Like, yeah, um, hands tied and face the enemy and all that. So, yeah. so you started out as, as a real as, as a real as a real bass playing kind of dude and. And then you figured, you know, fuck playing bass. I need to be fronting a band, right? Well, it's all, it's all part of my midlife crisis, Drew. I got to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. Um, no, you know what it is? Um, I, I've told this story before about how the band formed. And I love playing bass in bands. But the way this one formed, a guy I work with who is actually in the band literally walked into my office at work and said, yo, I got this friend, Carlos, who lives, I don't know, in North Carolina. He's got these riffs. He played a riff in my ear and he said, what do you think? And I said, I'll do it if I can sing. And that was literally how the band formed. Cause you know, doing yet another band this late in the game and having to get equipment again. Cause I sold a bunch of stuff when the other bands ended. It was just like, you know what? Let's, let's keep it simple. Let me show up with the mic and uh, speak my mind a little bit. And that was really why I ended up wanting to sing. Plus it's fun. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to sing in a band? Is um is it is it one of your one of your um bandmates uh, live lives outside of the country? Uh, well, a couple of them are from outside of the country, but they all live in the you know in the tri-state area. Okay, they're all in, in New York. And yeah. you do you consider do you guys consider yourself a straight edge band? Oh, without question, absolutely, undeniably, relentlessly. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> No, really. I mean, at this point, you know, I've done bands that are straight edge bands. I did a band called The Killing Flame, which was not a straight edge band. I've done bands where everybody was straight edge, but the message was wasn't about that. But at this point, I'm I'm really more interested in just trimming the fat and and making it very clearly about that message. I mean, and other messages too, but but the the underlying theme is that this is a New York City straight edge band. Do you remember there aren't that many, you know? Do you remember when um, when you guys were going to play the A7 for the first time and we had the conversation, you fucking straight edge guys, you know, I, you know. I remember it well. You're like, how, how can you guys play? You're, I mean, the only way this place stays open is when people buy booze at the bar. But I love the band and it you worked did, out. Man. I'm so grateful you gave us the shot, man, because 
just like the other guys were saying, those those shows have been our most fun, favorite shows. That, I mean, I say it on stage, I'll say it to you again, to, to get to play in a place so special um, with a whole new generation of kids. It's such a, a perfect melding of old and new. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. You know, hold on. I think I got something here. Let me try to dig it up. Let's see. I don't know how this is going to how this is going to sound. Let's hope for the best here. Oh, shit. Yeah. Speaking of old. Well, this, this is. Should I pipe down during this or what? I don't hear anything anyway. I don't think we have any sound here, Drew. Anybody there? Or... Can you guys hear this stuff or what? Are you there? Well, I heard it. Oh, you could hear it? I don't think we could hear it. Yeah. Hold on a second. It sounded awesome. We didn't screw up anything. No, but I mean, the reason we picked SSD, um, in addition to being a massive influence on me and the music that I like um, and on the band, I mean, obviously, SSD played A7, so we thought it was a perfect tribute. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, SSD is is a band that resonates with me, right? I mean, the first hardcore show that I ever saw in uh, 1981 was, it was an SSD control show, and there was 15 kids there. Right. So, you know, that, that, that uh, first show I went to. Where was that? That was at a place called the Media Workshop in Boston. Okay. And um, I mean, there's a whole backstory to it. You know, I went to college um, with, I went to Emerson College. So did with, I. Yeah, with, um, there was there there were there was a guy in when I first got up there as a freshman, there was there was a guy that um, in the cafeteria with his head shaved, and back then you know nobody shaved their head, and I was intrigued and I started talking to him and he said he was into hardcore. Now keep in mind this is August of 1981, and I started talking to him and he said he's into hardcore. I said hardcore, what do you mean hardcore? I mean like Blondie or Joan Jett. I actually said this or the B-52s, I didn't really have a reference for hardcore. And he, he said, no, like like Black Flag. I said, Black Flag, you know, I mean like the bug spray? And I had no idea. He said, look, instead of me um, trying to explain it to you, why don't you just come with me this weekend and we'll go to a show? So when that weekend rolled around, we got on our skateboards and we went to this sort of um, factory building, um, in Boston, and we went up like to the fifth floor. It was an art space, and it was a place called the Media Workshop. It was an all ages show, and uh, it was an S it turned out to be uh, an SSD control show. And there was about fifteen kids there. I think it was SSD control's third show. So you know, so I, I was there. I was there for that. But the person that brought me to the show, um, who was going to Emerson at the time, his name is Jack Kelly. At the time, he's known as Choke, and to this day, he's still in the game, and he sings for Slapshot. So, you know, that, that's pretty cool, right? Funny enough, when I was going to Emerson College much later, I started going there. I went there from 1991 to 1994 and then transferred um, to Rutgers to start Hands Tied um, with Tim McMahon and Sean McGrath from Mouthpiece. Um, but... I would still see Choke around campus and run after him while he was on his bike and ask him stories about Black Rod and the Boston crew and everything. And he couldn't have been nicer. So, well, listen, I was around for all that. You know, I'm thanked yeah. on the first SSD control record, and and I, I really um, I was around for that. You know, that whole era and awesome. and those guys and the whole early Boston straight edge thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it was a really special uh, and, and vibrant time. So. So what's up? What's up with the band? How you know? I love the I love I love the release you guys you know put out. You know what's what's going on with the band? Um, well, currently nothing. Um, ah. But um, 
big plans. Um, I've actually, we've got a bunch of new songs. We're working on a new record. I'm pushing to do another seven inch. Um, we already have like three or four new songs that are finished and a couple more in the works. Um, there was talk, I won't say with whom because it wasn't confirmed, but there was talk before this shit hit um, of going to Europe, uh, pretty serious talks. Um, and then some early preliminary talks about doing some shows in Japan too. So nothing finalized. Oh, there it is. Nothing finalized, but um, obviously all that talk stopped short when this nightmare began. So, but yeah. the band's absolutely 110% still together and still has plans to do as much as we can. Yeah. And, you know, you guys are another band, you know, you, you, you're, you're an A7 band, you know? You know, I'm I'm honored to hear you say that because it, it's those shows are our favorite by far. Even though you're even though you're even though you're a fucking straight edge band, you're an A7. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point out from the previous interview with uh, Mucky Pup, I have that um, that seven inch that came with the Bloom County book, and I, I wow. used to play that record all the time when I was a kid. Wow, I don't but, have it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Blue County, and that that was um, Bill the Cat's band, if if I can remember. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He's thankful. So yeah, that, that was awesome, man. I I didn't I didn't put the pieces together. We're dating, Ed, we're dating ourselves here massively, man. Everybody knows we're all old. Yeah. I know. I mean, I'm getting the pulling walnuts hair now that I haven't been able to get to a barber. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. Got the my. You get older, your hair grows out and right. up. That's yeah, exactly. well, the sides like grow more than the top. Uh, I look like a game show host. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah, right. Yeah, anybody, listen, anybody out there have any questions? Please post it up. Think up some. Post a question uh, for any of these guys. And, and uh, you I know. saw somebody asking about the Skull Crusher record, which was. Oh so yeah, cool. right, right. Yeah, I lost that somewhere along the line. Let me let me let me look for that. That was uh, a wildly. Uh, unpopular band that I sang for, but uh, we played a few shows. My friend Gordo and I went into a studio. I played everything and sang. Um, he played drums and I put the record out because I don't think anybody else would have on my old uh, record label called Livewire Records. And hey, it was fun. You know, we were, we were kind of going for more of like an Iceman leeway sort of vibe. And, you know, I guess we kind of missed the mark, but I saw the kid mention it. So I figured I'd bring it up. So, hey, um, listen, People, it looks like you got some people love it, you know. That's why I'm talking about it. I found the one guy who likes it, you know. Okay. Hey, there's people out there that love Antidote, Ret the Return to Burn record. So go figure. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah. So what's up? You know, if I, if, if I wanted wanted to say something about these A7 shows, um, one of the cool things is that we, you know, we played our first show there was with Locked Inside, and That's right. I come from where straight edge bands play with punk rock bands play with hardcore bands none of this you know click and divisiveness and all this nonsense and that's totally there at the a7 it's everything together where it's our scene which includes straight edge people and yeah. not straight edge people and you know not this you know hierarchy bullshit keeping people apart right when i was growing up too a lot of the bills were very mixed and i i you know that's to me that's what it's what hardcore's for me, it's what it's supposed to be about. You know what I mean? Right. A lot of different people with a lot of different opinions who are all united in the idea of coming together and enjoying some aggressive music, getting some energy, maybe some anger out, and all unified in the in the the the, the idea of of being together as part of the scene, no matter what your ideas might be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Ed, uh, we got a question from from Metal Game, who, who's a friend of ours. Uh, Young Metal Game, a big supporter of the A A7 shows. Uh, yeah. What 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 made you make the decision to be straight edge? Oh, that's a great question. Um, truthfully, I never was uh, anything but straight edge. It, I started calling myself straight edge when I heard Minor Threat. But as a little like twelve or thirteen year old kid getting into trouble with my friends and skateboarding and setting stuff on fire and just being you know, generally um, as uh, mischievous as you can be in Mendham, New Jersey. Um, when those guys got to be maybe like 14 or 15, you know, 
that stuff wasn't so fun anymore and they started to drink a little bit of booze smoke a little wacky tobacco and i was like come on guys what are you doing why you know that's what all the old guys are doing we're, we're out here having a blast setting things on fire and going buck wild and you want to sit in a room and just you know turn your mind to mush let's let's keep playing outside and having fun and so when those guys got into that stuff and by the way two of the four guys i'm talking about are dead from drugs um i went my own way and you know i heard minor threat and then later on you did today chain of strength and it was like holy shit these guys i mean uniform choice the Uniform Choice Scream for Change record, there are very few records early on in my growth of discovering what straight edge is and, and what my direction of life would be. There are a few records that, that hit me as hard as that record. Yeah. It was like Minor Threat and, and Uniform Choice were saying like the things that I was already feeling. It was like, oh my God, there's other people who feel this way and they skate and they're into hardcore. It was, it was like a no brainer for me. So to this day, I've never had a drink in my life. Hey, Dan. Uh, this one's for you. What were some of your favorite places to play in Jersey in the 90s? In the 90s? Yeah. There was only three places to play in Jersey. <laughs> it was uh, – originally there was a club called the China Club, which was like in Upper Bergen County. And that's a place that Mucky Pup played a lot. Um, but after that, it was uh, it was Studio One and the Pipeline Man. You know, and then, you know, down south, Club Benet – you know, like when we were lucky enough to be able to get a show at Club and Able, like Larry and Ed were talking about, uh, like I remember back at like Mucky Pup was like a comedy, uh, uh like like a like a comedy thrash metal hardcore band. That's and what I always thought like, it was. What's that? That's what that was my original perception. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that's what it was. You know, but like right. we would play, like you guys mentioned, we would play. The show with Murphy's Law, that was, I guess, a party New York hardcore band, sick of it all. Like, the shows had variation to them. Like, why would somebody want to go to a show and hear five bands that all sound identical? Right. You know? And and that was the beauty of that age is people, their minds were so open to all different types of music. And it was really, you know, an alternative music scene. There was New York hardcore and those bands to me separated themselves and created something that was just unbelievable. But it was more of an alternative music scene. We'd fishbone, Chili Peppers would come into town. Mucky Pup would play with the Chili Peppers. Next week, Mucky Pup would play in Connecticut with Sick of It All. Then Mucky Pup would play, you know, up at, uh, you know, at... John, what was that place in, uh, in Connecticut? The anthrax? Anthrax, oh, bro. Yeah, the anthrax, the fortune cookie. Like, you'd be playing with four or five different types of bands all in the same month. Right. Um, I think people just – people's minds were just more open to different styles of music. I totally agree with you there. Hey, the way, I can't let you uh, forget about City Gardens in terms of – City Gardens. I was going to just mention City Gardens. I grew up yeah. there before. Sure. That, that was, was your spot, right, Rap Bones? City Oh, Garden. man. I was with the family. You know it. <laughs> Hated and proud. Hated hey, and proud back then. I want to um I want to make uh we're gonna we're gonna head down the home stretch here. We got we got about 10 minutes left. Um I want to announce uh the next show that's coming up uh this Friday. Uh we're gonna really we're gonna put it into overdrive with uh with with Mr. with Mr. Uh, William Grazia Day for Biohazard. Nice. And uh, have you heard his album? Have you heard yeah. the Billy Bio album? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I don't know, man. I, I I think it's fucking incredible. Yeah, man. Billy's oh, doing it, man. I loved it. You know? I heard it. I dug it. Billy Billy's doing it. I I you know I love Billy. He's an old friend of mine. I have I have quite a history with him. Uh, you know I I uh, I did. Five biohazard videos. I produced five biohazard videos, including Punishment and Shades of Grey and Tales from the Hard Side. Yep. Um, you know, and I tour managed for Biohazard, and I love Billy. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him. He's out there and he's hustling. You know, his. You know, I respect his hustle. He's doing it. Um, he's. He's. You know, like 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 Jack Kelly from 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 Slapshot. You know, I respect his hustle. They're still doing it. They still have the passion in their heart, you know. So I'm real excited. Um, At a high level. 
Yeah, at a high level. At a high level, too. I just want to let everybody know, everybody that's listening out there, and I want to thank everybody for, for, for tuning in. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna to really keep this thing moving. Uh, the shows are going to be on Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. Uh, next show, I said, is, is with Billy. And then um, uh, this Sunday, we're going to do an A7 show with uh, Davey Gunner from Kraut oh, and uh, from End of Hope. And we're going to have the Car Bomb Parade on. So we're excited about that. And then next week, I'm going to have the infamous Michael Alago on. So awesome. should be should be, uh, should be quite the time. Um, let me think. Any other uh, any other any other questions? Let's see. Let me see what else we got here. Um, oh, what's this? Rap bones. I remember when Sick of It All stopped their show when the bouncers threw rap bones out. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't play until they let him bacon in. Back in. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a city gardens. There, there's a, look, there's a good sound bite from that actually that I know it. Lou says, "Hey, that's our buddy Rapones. Let him back in." And the sound guy goes, "We're not going to talk about that. Just keep it rolling." Like that was it. I wasn't. Yeah, there's video of that. They didn't get me out, but they got me out. You know. <laughs> City Garden used to toss people out just for stage diving. Or I mean, I did get back in, no question. Infamous, infamous Jersey character. <laughs> I was banned from City Garden, so if I'm on any City Garden's footage, I was, you know, how it was back then. Right. Hey, Stephen, you're gonna dig up another photo for us for for the next show. Another another winner like that stigma show. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think I got one or two in the archive. Right. Well, here's another one. Rap Bones, you're hot here. I remember Rap Bones couldn't get into Coney Island High because he had no shoes. Ooh. Oh, that's a good one. Ouch. I'm not talking about these things. <laughs> My kid's going to look at the show. Yeah. Good one. Yep. He was still at Coney Island I High, I did get a pair of $2 shoes off the sidewalk on 2nd Avenue, though, and get in. Is this, is this you, Ed? Killing Flame? Why Killing Flame break up? Oh, well, I left the band um, like a few years before they broke up. We did an LP um, with Equal Vision, um, which I, you know, it was another one of my wildly unsuccessful projects. But I, th I without patting myself on the back, I didn't write it. Joe Foster from Unity and Ignite um, wrote most of the record, so I can say it. Uh, I thought it was an awesome record. Um, and we had people like Pat Dubar, the singer from Uniform Choice, do a guest spot on it. Um, Alex from Chain of Strength did some some stuff on it. Um, a lot of kind of cool stuff like that and you know we played a bunch of shows that were pretty good out in california when i lived there um but the band broke up well after i was in the band i moved back um from california and quit the band amicably um not that long after the lp came out and thank you to steve Reddy from equal vision for taking a chance on that record i don't, I don't think it was a, a big hit for him but I'm proud of that record. I think it's a good record. So, yeah, I can keep going if you want. I mean, did we lose Drew? Well, Listen, I don't know. If, if if you lose me, you lose me for a minute, for a second. So, you know. one thing, one thing I will say is that the the locked inside EP is yeah. is just killer. Oh, like, thank you, man. All I five songs, you. awesome. Five songs, eight minutes, and it's like. Outs to me, it's outstanding. Like I, I think it's great, man. Really well thought out, good songs. Seasons That's change, obviously, is a really good song. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're talking to a good friend of ours about um, actually doing the sort of video slash PSA um, for that song. That'll make sense when it's done. But thank you, and coming from you, that's that's incredibly cool to hear. So, hey, hey, we've mastered the art of doing free videos. You just got to hit up <laughs> everybody you know and beg. Yeah, and that's how you get free videos, man. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta make a video for never know what you might find. I'm begging people. I'm out, I'm out on the street right now, begging people to get footage. You know. Sure. Hey, Dan, Dan, do you see that uh, that question about uh, riding with Eddie for leeway? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. How was it? A fucking nightmare. Was, I, I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest. First of all, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Eddie Sutton fan, and 
you know, I, I jumped at the chance to do it, but it was really an odd writing process because I wrote all of the music for the song for I'm Your Pusher. And I actually recorded the guitar to a click track. This is not the way that I like to record, but this is how it got made. I, I played a guitar track to a click track. And then John Milnes went in the studio, played drums to the click track and the music that was already written. Then I went back in, redid the guitar parts, and then, and you know, I had like the I'm your pusher hook line out of the music. But other than that, Eddie sat in the studio for about, you know, at least two or three weeks. I didn't hear a thing he was doing. And after three weeks, they called me back in the studio to hear the 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 vocals that he did on the song. And I was like blown away. I was like, holy shit, like this is really great. So I think Eddie did like a phenomenal job uh, vocally on the song. And, you know, I basically just handed him like, all right, the songs, here's all the music. It's all recorded. And go ahead. Do you know, here's, you know, I'm your push up and bump. And that was it. He took the rest of it. And, uh, you know, Laz, uh, Laz Pina from El Nino, obviously, was heavily involved down there in, in, uh, in Hoboken at Sound Wars Studios. And Eddie just locked, they just locked Eddie in a room for three weeks. And uh, they got they got the best out of him, I thought. I mean, I think he sounds great on the song. I got to be honest. Like, I, I like listening to the song. I dig it. Yeah. Cool song. Hey, uh, I want to thank all you guys for coming on the the inaugural show. You're um, welcome. And uh, you know we punched our way through it. Uh, you guys will have to come on again. I want to thank everybody else that from around the world that uh, that tuned in. And uh, please track these guys down. Locked inside. Kings never die. If you're in New York City, you know come by one of the A7 shows. That you know the shows are going to resume. Uh, once the zombie apocalypse uh, is over, so which is probably going to be a couple months, the way things are going. But uh, that's it. Uh, like I said, uh, we'll see you again on Friday at three o'clock with uh, Billy from Biohazard, and, and we'll have our regular, some of our regular people on, like Rap Bones and Sid, uh, Stephen, uh, Steve Messina will be on with the picture of the day, and we're just going to keep this thing rolling, and uh, you know get some momentum. And most of all, have some fun with it and keep it positive. So thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, thanks Drew. Thanks for having us, Drew. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. Take care. Take care, Take everybody. care of yourself. Thanks, Drew. My pleasure. Thanks.